Beloved, grace and peace be unto you. From God who loves us as mother and father and Jesus Christ, who alone and always is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning redeemer. As you get ready to hear a word from the Lord in this virtual space of worship, won't you bow with me in prayer as we invite the Holy Spirit to guide our hearing and our living. God, as always, I thank you for your spoken word. You stepped in the middle of nothingness and said, let there be, and whatever you spoke came to be. We thank you for the gift of your written word, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. You know, God, how we glorify you for your incarnate word, the word become flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ that we might know what living the word was all about. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the power to preach the word of God. Ask always that you would lift me above the frailty of my own flesh, that God may be glorified. And Lord, we thank you for the ability to not only hear your word, but to do it. That as we become living examples of the word of God, we'll experience the fruit of your word. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today I want to invite you to continue to journey with me in our summer sermonic series as we are taking a look at some of the most beautiful, poetic, powerful, and beloved passages of Scripture located in the book of Psalms. You recall that we've borrowed and plagiarized from Stevie Wonder and that our series is entitled Psalms and the Key of Life. Because I would argue with you that no matter what key of life you are living in or listening to, there's a psalm that relates to that. There's a psalm that resonates with it. Maybe that's one of the reasons Jesus quotes from the book of Psalms more than any other book in the Bible. Because there's something about the psalms that not only resonate with where we are in life, but also teach us something about walking with God. It is the New Testament professor James Mays who says, and I quote, that the Psalms, while they teach you what God is like, they will also give you strength in adversity, gratitude in success, hope in the midst of sorrow, penitence in guilt, thanksgiving in blessing, and faith in the middle of despair. And somebody, you may need to hear this because you may have mistakenly assumed that these 150 Psalms are just about praise and thanksgiving and shouting hallelujah and saying amen. But you and I both know that a real life has a way of putting you in a place where shouting hallelujah and lifting up hands and saying amen is not the reality of where you find yourself in life. And if you mistakenly think that the Psalms are just about praise, when you find yourself in those real places where praise is not at the top of your agenda, I need you to be reminded that the Psalms still encourage, they still speak, and they still teach. Ty, when you read through the book of Psalms, you'll be surprised to find out that the Psalms touch on some issues that we ignore too often in church. There are some psalms written from the depth of despair where the psalmist and the people of God have reached a place where praise is not what they feel like doing. There are some psalms that are written out of an angry heart, someone who's confused about how God has acted or has not acted. And they lift up these words of anger and frustration with God. And then there are these imprecatory psalms from the verb imprecate, which literally means to call down. And the imprecatory psalms, Kim, those are the psalms where the psalmist dares call on God and ask God to rain down vengeance on their enemies. God, deal with them for what they did with me. Make them know my pain. There's even a psalm where the psalmist says, Lord, and kill their children. The psalms deal with some issues that we don't talk about much in church. One of those issues comes to us in Psalm 14. I want you to hear the words of the psalmist 
in this 14th Psalm that lifts up a reality that so often we ignore in our sanctified states. Hear the words of Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, and there's no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, if there are any who seek God. All have turned away, all have become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread, and they never call on the Lord. But there they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. As we meditate on these words of Psalm 14 and continue on in our series, Psalms in the Key of Life, today I'd just like to declare in your hearing, I'm not a fool. I'm not a fool. One of the fields of studies when one engages the Psalms is to see within the Word of God how the Psalms are repeated how they're repeated outside the book of Psalms, as we find Paul and Jesus, and even some of the prophets quoting Psalms, showing that they were well familiar with the words of the Psalter and seeing how these Psalms are repeated outside the book of Psalms. Internal to the book of Psalms, a good Bible study will be to see how certain phrases and themes are repeated in the Psalms. Themes like, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Themes and phrases like, for his mercy endureth forever. How those are repeated throughout the Psalms. One interesting study is to also see how some of the Psalms borrow from and are based upon some other Psalms. As an example, Psalm 40 borrows extensively from Psalm 70. Psalm 71 borrows from Psalm 31. Psalm 108 is a combination of Psalm 57 and Psalm 60, that these psalms are repeated within the psalms themselves. As you read through the book of Psalms, what may surprise you is that, yes, there are repeated themes. Yes, some of the psalms borrow from other psalms. Yes, the psalms are quoted outside of the Psalter. But what may surprise you is that within the book of Psalms, there is only one Psalm that it was repeated verse for verse. Within all 150, there is only one Psalm in its totality that is repeated twice in the book of Psalms. I want to make certain you catch this. It may show up on verses one day. There is one Psalm that shows up twice in the book of Psalms. And it will surprise you what that Psalm is. Terrence, it's not Psalm 30, weeping may endure for a night. No, that's not repeated. It's not Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That does not show up twice. It is not Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. That doesn't show up twice. It's not Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. That Psalm is not repeated. It's not Psalm 27, wait on the Lord and he will strengthen your heart. That Psalm doesn't show up twice. You want to know what Psalm shows up twice? Psalm 14. It's not only repeated in Psalm 14, it shows up in repetition in Psalm 53. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a moment to go ahead and prove if I'm right. 
Take a look at Psalm 14 and then turn to Psalm 53 and you will see that Psalm 53 is the exact same psalm. The 14 and 53 are the exact same words and it is the only psalm that shows up twice in the Psalter. Now, what you need to remember is that somewhere between 500 B.C. and 70 A.D., the second temple period, that the religious leaders of Israel began to gather the Psalms, which were individual on scrolls, and they began to put all these scrolls together to form one book. In a real sense, between 500 B.C., and 70 AD, they turned the singles into an album. They put all the Psalms together, and you will remember from the Sermon on Psalm 1 that there was intentionality on how these editors put the Psalms together. There was both thought and theology that went into the structuring of the Psalms. The Psalms are not random. Some Psalms were left out. Others were put together. They were put in certain sections. They were ordered in certain ways. There's intentionality in the editors who put the Psalms together. And these editors who put the Psalms together deliberately chose to put Psalm 14 as a repetition in Psalm 53. They knew that 15, 14 and 53 were the same, and yet they made the decision to put them in twice, and that was the only psalm they put in twice. They didn't repeat 46. They didn't repeat 23. They didn't repeat 37. They didn't repeat 30. They didn't repeat 100. They didn't repeat 91. They didn't repeat 150. The only psalm they intentionally repeat it, says this, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God. If I haven't lost you yet, you ought to be asking a question. Why did these religious editors and leaders with intentionality and thought allow this verse to be repeated? Why put this psalm twice in the Psalter? Why lift up this reality twice? Well, there are a lot of scholarly theories about why the editors repeated Psalm 14 in Psalm 53. But what we do know is this. The repetition of that phrase, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God, causes us to deal with the reality in life that there will always be people who doubt and even deny the existence of God. Psalm 14, repeated in Psalm 53, in the Psalms in the key of life, remind us that in some people's lives, God is not real. We don't talk about it much in church, but Psalm 14, repeated in Psalm 53, raises the reality of agnosticism and atheism. Agnosticism and atheism. As agnostics are those who neither believe in God nor do they deny God, agnostics argue that you can't prove whether God is real or not, so it's fruitless to even have the debate. Agnostics don't say they deny God, but at the same time they don't believe in God, and they simply say you can't prove that God is real. Atheists flat out reject the reality of God. Atheists have landed in a place where they say there is no God. Atheists would argue that God is not real. And this Psalm 14, repeated in 53, reminds us that all around us, there are agnostics and atheists. All around us, there are those who doubt God and maybe even those who deny God. Life is filled with agnostics and atheists. As a matter of fact, the Pew Research Center released some data that shows in the last 23 years, 
atheism has risen in American society. And that today in 2022, more than 10% of Americans self-identify as atheists. 10% said they're atheists. Many more probably don't believe in God and many, many more doubt that God is real or disbelieve in God. So the chances are very high that you know, that I know, that we all know someone who doubts, denies, or does not believe in the existence of God. All of us know someone who doubts and wonders if God is real. Psalm 14 makes that a reality to us, but, but Psalm 14 is also dangerous. It lifts up the reality of atheism. It, it brings to mind the reality of agnosticism, but it does it in a dangerous way because Psalm 14 declares that the one who does not believe in God is a fool. And family, I would suggest to you that we must be careful in how we use the word fool. The word fool in Hebrew is the term naval. And naval in Hebrew does not mean foolish in the same way we think of foolish in English. Naval, fool, is not the same in Hebrew as it is in English. Naval does not mean foolish in the sense of stupid and unwise and unintellectual. I think that's important because I don't know if we can really say that Sigmund Freud was stupid. I don't think that, that we can safely say that Emil Durkheim and Charles Darwin were illogical. I don't think we can say that Stephen Hawking is, is a fool. And we got to be careful in that because there's someone you know who, who's agnostic. There's someone you know who may be atheistic, and they are far from stupid. They are not dumb. They are not illogical. They are not irrational. we got to be careful how we use the word fool. The word fool does not mean stupid. It doesn't mean illogical. It doesn't even mean unrighteous. You need to hear that because there's some agnostics and some atheists, some people who doubt, some people who deny the reality of God, and they're not evil. They're not wicked. Can, can I testify? I know some atheists who are good people. I know some agnostics who love folk. I know some folk who doubt the reality of God, but still treat one another kindly. And in the same breath, I know some ugly Christians. I know some nasty churchgoers. I know some hypocritical folk who say they believe in God all day long. And if I had my druthers, I would rather spend an evening with a kind agnostic rather than a hypocritical Christian. We've got to be careful how we use the word fool. And one of the reasons we've got to be careful is because you can never effectively witness to anyone who you call a fool. You can't effectively witness to someone if you default think that what they believe and where they stand is foolish. Brother and sister, I want to suggest to you today in this sermon that one of the most damaging and destructive things in the body of Christ are closed-minded Christians who judge someone's position without taking time to understand the road that led them there. Let me say this again. One of the most destructive things in the body of Christ are closed-minded Christians who judge someone's position, their thought, their belief, without taking time to understand the road that led them there. Before you deem their position stupid, why don't you ask them how they got there? Before you think that what they believe is foolish, why don't you take a moment to know the experiences they've had that have led them there? 
Before you tell someone that they're on their way to hell because of where they stand and what they believe and what they think, why don't you take a minute to learn the road that led them to think what they think and believe what they believe? Why don't you take a moment to understand? So before you call me a demon and say I'm blasphemous and I'm going to hell because I preached a sermon, I'm with her, why don't you take a moment to actually listen to the sermon and understand the logic and the road that led me to stand where I stand? What we need most in life are more believers who can peacefully disagree with someone who believes differently. But the only way you can peacefully disagree is if you respect the road that led someone to believe differently than you do. If I can respect the road that led you there, we can disagree without wanting to hurt each other. If I take time to understand the experiences that shaped you and left you thinking the way you think, maybe we can sit at a table together and I not damn you to hell. If you can understand why I got where I got, then maybe we don't have to stand in separate corners and curse at one another. If I can learn to respect the road that led you to where you are, that's how we peacefully disagree. So as Psalm 14 raises the reality of atheism and agnosticism, our responsibility is to ask this question. What road leads someone to an atheistic mindset? What experience makes someone agnostic? What is it that someone goes through that leaves them doubting and denying the reality of God. What is the road to atheism? Well, understand that some people are raised in a culture and by customs that are inherently atheistic. People are raised in societies where there is no concept of God. Prime example, China. Traditional children raised in Chinese culture and educational systems are not taught to inherently believe in God in those cultures and those communities. They don't believe in a God. It's one of the reasons why our missionary efforts are so critical across the world that we might bring an acknowledgement of the reality of God into communities and cultures that are inherently atheistic. But, but let's leave China alone and, and let's talk about countries where God is inherently believed in. What about countries where Christianity and Islam and Judaism are dominant religions? What about the United States of America, one nation under God? What about communities where there's a church on every corner? And the Bible is quoted repeatedly. And there are so-called Christians walking around you every day. How does someone raise, be raised in a culture and a community where God is believed and yet they wind up atheistic? That, that, that is the context of Psalm 14. Psalm 14 is written in ancient Israel. In a community and a country where they believed in God. Children were raised learning the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. In ancient Israel, the temple was the center of Israeli culture. Scriptures were read daily. Pharisees and priests and rabbis walked around every day. Israel was inherently a God-believing country. And yet the psalmist says that in the midst of that country, in the midst of that community, in the midst of that culture, there were some that said, there is no God. How can someone raised in Israel not believe in God? How can someone who saw the temple every day not believe in God? 
How can someone who heard the Bible being quoted not believe in God? How could someone who walked by a portrait of Moses every day and heard the story of the Exodus, how could someone in that community not believe in God? Well, Psalm 14 gives a little bit of an answer. Because if you read verse 1 and verse 3 and verse 4, you'll find the answer. You want to know how someone raised in a religious culture that believed in God could still wind up not believing in God? Here's what the psalmist says. Because there was so much evil around that this person could not understand how evil could coexist with God. You know what led them not to believe in God? It's simple. They saw evil without divine justice. They wondered how could there be a God? You wanna know how they lost faith in God? They experienced a tragedy without the intervention of God. And they wondered if God could be real. You wanna know how they lost faith in God? They saw some really bad things happened to some really good people, and they could not understand how God could allow that to happen. You want to know how they lost faith in God? They prayed and asked God to do this, and God instead allowed that. And because their prayers were not answered the way they thought, they began to doubt the reality of God. Beloved, in a real sense, this is still an issue, and we call it theodicy. Let the church say theodicy. Theodicy. Theodicy is the attempt to reconcile the reality of evil with the concept of God. The theodicy is where all of us will find ourselves at some moment in life when you've gone through something and all you want to know is how could God let this happen? where the worst has happened, and now you're wondering why God would allow that to happen. Theodicy. Theodicy is when a child is born with cancer and only given months to live. You ask God, how could you let this happen? Theodicy is when innocent children in Uvalde go to school one day and evil shows up and claims multiple lives, leaving parents and a nation and a world wondering, where was God? The Odyssey is when a drunk driver runs into a car and kills everyone in the car, but the drunk driver walks away without a bruise or a scratch. How did God let this happen? The Odyssey it's when mama, who's never smoked a day in her life, gets lung cancer. And there's a brother down the street who can't even spell Jesus, and he lives to 97, drinking and smoking every day. God, how can you let this happen? Have you ever had a theodicy moment? Have you ever had a moment when something went down that caused you to question whether God is real? Family, what Psalm 14 suggests to us, is that the Odyssey opens the door to atheism. The Odyssey is the first step in wondering if God is real. The Odyssey puts you in a place where you begin to question, is God really who I thought God was? The Odyssey sows the seeds of doubt and denial and disbelief. The Odyssey is where people testify they lost their faith in God. You all are familiar with Amber Heard. Just came through a public nasty divorce with Johnny Depp. Amber Heard is a self-professed atheist. Now what may shock you is that Amber Heard was raised a devout Catholic. 
She was raised by a mother and a father that put her in Catholic school, and they went to Mass every week, and she received communion, and she passed her catechism, and she confessed in Jesus Christ. So what you ought to be asking is, how can a woman who was raised Catholic be an atheist? And Amber Heard will testify to you that when she was 15, her best friend was killed in a car accident. And she could not understand how God could allow her friend to die in an accident. And at 15, she said she stopped believing in God. Why? Because she had a theodicy moment. Theodicy opens the door to agnosticism and atheism. That when you're in that place where you can't understand how God and why God would allow this happen, many folk walk away no longer believing in God. Can I push it? The question theodicy raises and how it leads to atheism, how someone loses their faith in God, the very first question that must be asked, and, and forgive me if we're getting too deep today, but the first question that must be asked is what do you mean when you say God. How do you define God? When you hear the term God, what comes to mind in your thinking? When you envision God, what portrait is in your mind's eye? I remember as a child growing up, whenever I heard God, I would think of a, of a man sitting on a throne with lightning bolts in his hand who judged the world and controlled everything, that, that my image of God was a man who ruled over everything. When you hear God, what do you think? How do you define that term? Well, in traditional Christianity, God encompasses at least three characteristics. If you look at the definition and ideology of God throughout the history of humanity, especially in Christian thought, you'll find that the idea, the concept of God embraces three things. Can I push them on you? Number one is omnipotence, the ability to do anything and everything. That if God means anything, God must be synonymous with omnipotence. That God has to be that which is able to do whatever God wants to do. If God is not omnipotent, then God cannot be God. God is synonymous with omnipotence. God is also synonymous with omniscience. That for God to be God, God has to know everything. God has to see everything. There can be nothing that is hidden from God. Your thoughts are known to God. Your emotions are known to God. Your past is known to God. Your future is known to God. What the enemy is planning is known to God. That God must not only be omnipotent, God must be omniscient. And God must be good, holy, pure, incapable of evil, non-malicious, Gracious and, and merciful and loving that for God to be God, God, God has to be incapable of sin, incapable of evil, incapable of making a mistake, incapable of being wrong. The three characteristics of God in, in traditional Christianity, omnipotence can do anything, omniscience knows everything, and holy, good, pure, and loving, incapable of evil. Now, if you get those three characteristics, omnipotence, omniscience, good, loving, holy, pure, just, then you can understand how theodicy makes some folk doubt God. Because in a theodicy moment, in a moment when something bad happens to something good, someone good, one of those three it's challenged. Pastor, you better teach today. In theodicy, one 
of the three characteristics of God is challenged. So let's hypothetically say a drunk driver kills an innocent child walking down the street. That's a theodicy moment. It's going to cause someone to ask how God let that happen and why God didn't stop that. And here's the way some thought goes. Some thought will say, well, God is good and loves us. God knew it was going to happen, but God couldn't stop it because that was the action of the drunk driver. And therefore, omnipotence is challenged. And if God is not omnipotent, then there can be no God. Or someone may say, well, God knew it was going to happen because God's omniscient. God is capable of stopping the drunk driver because God is omnipotent. But God chose not to. For whatever reason, it was in God's will that that happened. And for someone, that means God is not good. God is not pure. God is not holy. And if God is not good and God's not pure and God's not holy, there can be no concept of God. Or thirdly, someone could say, well, God is omnipotent. God could have stopped. God loves us and God would never want that to happen. That can't be God's will. But God didn't know it was going to happen because that's free will and choice. And God doesn't know all of that. So now God is not omniscient. So watch it. In theodicy, one of the three is challenged. Either we challenge the omnipotence which means God can't be God. We challenge the love, which means God can't be God. Or we challenge the omniscience, which means that God cannot be God. Listen, I'm not saying that's how you think, but respect the road that has led people there that when they've gone through a theodicy moment, they wonder if God is omnipotent, why didn't God stop it? If God is loving, how could God have willed it? And if God knew, why didn't God intervene? That that is what leads people down the road of, of atheism, that theodicy opens the door. And from there, other forces go to work. Once theodicy has opened the door, Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection kick in. Once theodicy knocks on the door, the lack of scientific proof of the existence of God will kick in. Once the Odyssey opens the door, the debate about the accuracies or the inaccuracies of Scripture begin to show up. Once the Odyssey opens the door, using science to explain all the phenomena of the universe remove any faith or the concept of miracles. Once the Odyssey opens the door, Sigmund Freud's proposition that religion is just an opiate, a drug to help us escape the rough realities of life kicks in. Once the Odyssey opens the door, the concept that faith is just a psychological fantasy to help me believe someone is in control and that life has some kind of purpose and that there has to be something after death because humans can't deal with the rough reality of death. All of that begins to kick in. Once we have a theodicy moment, we can be on the road to Psalm 14. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. Beloved, how do you prove God is real? What Christian answer do we give to Sigmund Freud, to Emile Durkheim, to Charles Darwin, to that brother or that sister you know that's had a theodicy moment and doubts the omnipotence of God or doubts the omniscience of God or doubts the love of God? How do we prove God is real? How can you prove that there is truly a God? Well, Psalm 14 seems to point at a plausible answer. And it's not the answer you think. 
Psalm 14 gives us a hint from the psalmist's perspective about the reality of God. Verse 1, atheism, agnosticism, because of theodicy. Verse 1, the fool has said there's no God. Verse 2, God looks out from heaven, wondering if there are any wise enough to seek him. Want well, to make sure you catch this. Verse 1, theodicy has led to agnosticism and atheism. Verse 2, God is wondering if the wise will seek him. Verse 1, the fool says no God. Verse 2, the wise make a decision to seek him. Verse 1, atheism. Verse 2, decision. Here it is. God is not something I prove. God is what I choose. Go and say that, Pastor. That, that God is not a fact that is proven. God is a decision that is made. That, that, that God is not believed based on scientific theory or philosophical ideology. God is a faith decision that I must make in my own life that I decide to believe in God. I decide to choose God. I decide to trust in God. Beloved, I come by and tell you after almost 25 years of preaching, I've encountered a whole lot of folk who've had theodicy moments stood at a crossroad where the worst had happened and they realized in that moment they had a choice to make. That either I abandon God or I choose to believe in God. And there are some folk who've been through the worst of life, who've seen the bottom drop out, who've had to bury a loved one prematurely, and they yet made a decision that they were going to believe in God because God is not a fact that is proven. God is a choice that is made. Give you a side order scripture. That, 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 that's why Adam and Eve stand in front of the tree and God says, you got to make a choice. That's why Paul says that when Jesus is proclaimed to you, you've got to make a decision. That's why when Joshua stood in front of the children of Israel, he said, choose you this day what you're going to do. Either you'll believe in God or you'll abandon God. But God is a choice and a decision that you have to make. But beloved, before I finish this sermon, can I tell you something? That, that's, that's why the devil can't stand you. That's why you are under demonic attack. That's why you're engaged in spiritual warfare. Because you chose God rather than choosing his path. That in spite of the scientific evidence, in spite of the psychological argumentation, in spite of Sigmund Freud, in spite of theodicy, in spite of all you've been through, you still made the decision to trust God. And your decision has angered your enemy. How can you still believe in God? After all the hell you've been through, after all the funerals you attended, after all the sickness you've engaged and encountered, how can you still make a decision to believe in God? Beloved, faith is a choice. Discipleship is a choice. Trusting God is a choice. Believing the Lord is a choice. Putting your life in God's hands is a decision that you have to make. You, you remember when I told you that Naval doesn't mean fool in Hebrew? Uh, th th this might blow your mind. The, the, the best translation of Naval. Watch this. Naval doesn't really mean imp uh, foolish. Naval means empty. So, so watch, watch the translation. The empty has said in his heart, there is no God. Not the unwise, not the unrighteous, not the immoral, but the empty. Okay, let me explain it, Angie. Here's, here's the best analogy. 
Let's say you reach in your pocket and you're looking for some money, but there's no money in your pocket. And when you pull your hand out, you say there is no money. Now, that doesn't mean that money doesn't exist. What it means is you ain't got no money in your pocket. <laughs> it doesn't mean that there's no real money. It just means that you are empty of money. The empty have said there is no God. And I want to close right here and tell you why I'm not a fool. It's not because I can debate Sigmund Freud. It's not because I can debunk natural evolution. It's not because I understand the psychology of all the atheists. Let me tell you why I'm not a fool. Because I'm not empty. That when I reach into my life, there's some things I pull back that allow me to know that I know that God is real. Can, can, can I tell you what, what I find when I dig into the pocket of my life? When I dig into the pocket of my life, I pull out the protection that God has given. Listen, somebody, you've been where I've been. There have been some moments in life when I know something worse should have happened to me. There have been some moments in my life where I know the test should have been positive and it came back negative. There's some moments in my life when I know people plotted and planned for my destruction and it did not happen. There's some moments that I know I brought some stuff on myself that never came to pass. I did not reap everything I've sown. There are some moments when I know my life has been protected. Have you ever been there? Have you ever looked death in the eye and death walked away? Have you ever dealt with enemies and they quit? Have you ever seen the worst turn into the best? Have you ever had a moment when you know your life was protected? And when that happens, you got a choice to make. How is it that you are alive when you should be dead? How is it that you're still standing in a sane mind when you ought to be crazy? How is it that you're still living with all that you've been through? You all know, I just survived by the grace of God, a near fatal car accident. Haven't testified much about it. The car was hit and flipped over four times. I woke up in an ambulance. And Terrence, what woke me up was that they were sticking an IV in my arm. And I woke up and I looked around and I said, what happened? And here's what the medic said to me. Sir, you're lucky to be alive. And in that moment, I made a choice and a decision to share with that medic it ain't got nothing to do with luck. That my life has been spared, not because I was lucky, not because the airbags in the car deployed, not because the mechanical uh, physics of the accident allowed me to hit a tree at the right angle so the cosine and the arc of the angle kept me from enduring the blow. No, the only reason I'm alive is because there's a God who had his hand on my life. And that is a choice you have to make. Shame on you if you've been protected and didn't see God. Shame on you if you looked death in the eye and still walked away empty. Shame on you if you've lived through hell and still have joy and don't realize that if it had not been for the Lord on your side. Yeah. I'm not a fool because I know the protection God has given. Let me give you one more. I'm not a fool because I know the promises God has kept. Can, can, I, can I tell you why I choose God? Can I tell you why I choose to believe in spite of all those who don't? 
Because it's simple. One too many times, my life has perfectly aligned itself with the word of God. One too many times, God's word has shown up in my life. One too many times, I saw what was meant for evil work out for my good. One too many times, I stood still and I watched the Lord fight a battle. One too many times, I showed up and a table was prepared in the presence of my enemies. One too many times, I waited on God and he renewed my strength. One too many times, the weeping I endured turned into joy. One too many times, I brought my offering to the Lord and he opened up the windows of heaven and poured down on me what I don't deserve. One too many times, my life has perfectly aligned itself with the word of God. And beloved, I'm too smart to think that's random. It's happened too much for me to think it's a figment of my imagination. It's happened too much for me to think it's just an opiate to help me deal with the rough realities of life. It's happened one too many times to be natural selection and evolution. It's happened one too many times for it to be anything other than a God who keeps his word, a God who does what he said he's gonna do, a God who says, if you trust me, you'll see me, a God who has been faithful to his word. I, I, I've seen the protection he's given. I, I know the promises he's kept. But here's the third reason why I'm not a fool and I'm done. Because I know the prayers God has answered. Goodbye, Alfred Street. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I know that I've been in some situations where my back was against the wall. I've been in some circumstances where nobody could help me. I've been in some experiences where my options were cut off. And the only thing I could do was get down on my knees and lift up my voice and ask God to help me in my situation. And I don't care if you don't believe in God. What I know is that after the amen, Things started to change. After the amen, doors started to open. After the amen, angels started to show up. After the amen, God moved it in another direction. And I just believe I'm not the only one in this sermonic moment who knows God has answered prayers. God heard my feeble cry. God knew what I stand in need of. And everything shifted after I prayed. So if you're empty, I know why you don't believe in God. If you're empty, I understand why you didn't make that choice. But if you know that your life has been saved and spared, if you know that you've walked in the fulfillment of the word of God, if you know that prayer changed something, then you ought to be able to testify like the old saints. I'm done now, but I was raised old school Baptist. And in the old school Baptist church, there's a song that Mama Callie Mae Greer used to sing at Herman Baptist Church. So it's Callie Mae Greer, 1754 North Clark Street, Chicago, Illinois, Herman Baptist Church. You skid up on Sunday and she could only sing one song. And these were the words to that song. She'd get up in front of that congregation and here's what she's saying. There are some things I may not know. And there are some places I cannot go. But I am sure of this one thing, that God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. Yes, God is real. He's real in my soul. Yes, God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. 
His love for me is just like pure gold. And yes, God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. I'm not a fool. Today I pray that you will make a decision to trust God. That you will look back and see God has spared your life. God has fulfilled his word in your life. God has answered the prayers you've lifted. And so you have to choose to believe in God. The fool said there's no God. I'm not a fool. Lord, I thank you that I'm not the only one who's not empty. That we can reach back in our lives and pull out your protection, pull out your faithfulness, pull out your grace. And Lord, no one's got to prove that you're real to me. I know it for myself. Lord, if there be anyone listening today who did not believe in you, who's not made a choice for Jesus Christ, may your Holy Spirit touch their mind and their heart even now that they might surrender and say yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Listen, if you're listening today and you want to make that choice for the Lord, our family of faith would love to share with you God's plan of salvation for your life. It would be our thrill to welcome you into this family of faith, no matter where you are in the World Wide Web. All you have to do is go out on the website. You'll see the easy banner to click down. Give us your name. Give us a way to contact you. And we will reach out to you even today to share with you what God has in store for you. Let's get ready to leave out of this virtual space of worship as those who are not a fool, but those who believe in God. And now, to the Almighty, the All-Wise, the Sovereign, the Omnipotent God, who alone is creator of heaven and earth, to the God who has made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial Savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer, to the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed the Lord who loved the Lord and knew the Lord was real said amen. It's Pastor Wesley. I'll catch you next time in worship.